Welcome to another episode of the Spoon Mob Podcast. This week, I am joined by Chef David Willocks, who is the owner and executive chef of The Baker's Table, which is a restaurant in Newport, Kentucky. It's just across the Ohio River from Cincinnati, so just on the other side of the river. You know, you have the Spence Bridge, which is undergoing a whole thing because they had that truck uh, explode with chemicals on it like two years ago, I think. And so the bridge has been partially shut down, but that's kind of the main connective artery across. There's a couple other ways you can get there the Roebling Bridge which they just did uh, some renovations to as well but he also runs the Baker's Table Bakery which is a new concept that they just recently opened uh, hasn't been open that long probably maybe like a year or so ago kind of born out of COVID and everything with a pivot so we talk about that and pretty much everything else you know he started out as a jazz musician wound up in New York then we talk about kind of his career how it unfolded throughout the hospitality industry how he wound up in kind of the Cincinnati area the idea for the Baker's Table running that, getting some great press. You know, they were featured in USA Today, Eater. So, I mean, they've had some major publications feature them. Both those articles are probably uh, just, you know, a couple years old. You can easily find them if you do a quick Google search. Uh, They'll pop pretty much right up. We talk about the Baker's Table Bakery and sustainability, you know, future, what that brings. So it's a really, really interesting in-depth conversation. We have been to the Baker's Table previously. It's a great time. It's a different style of setup. They kind of do the prefix menu now. So that's when we went, which was before COVID was the last time we were there. We're going to be going back again here shortly in the next couple of weeks. So we're super excited for that to just kind of see how things have progressed since the first time we were there. I can't find the photos that I took. We mostly ordered pasta. And then we got the donut holes at the end that they had for dessert. It was on a Thursday because they have a jazz night from like five to seven, but I cannot for the life of me find the photos. So if I do, I'll post them. If not, I'll just post some new shots that I take once we go. You can follow everything on Instagram. You can follow Dave on Instagram. It's at Dave underscore Willocks. It's W-I-L-L-O-C-K-S. Also follow the restaurant at Baker's Table Newport and then the bakery too as well at Baker's Table Bakery. So all those are on Instagram. Check out their website, reservations, hours, menus, menu updates, special events too as well. They've hosted a few pop-ups. Uh, they hosted Jordan Anthony Brown did a pop-up last year who was an alumni of this podcast. And then also Chris O'Hearn of Parcel Wine did the wine pairings for that dinner too. And he's also an alumni of this podcast. So you can check both those guys out too on Instagram and listen to those episodes if you haven't. They're doing a bunch of different events. They got pizza nights too as well um, that they're doing over there. So we're going to try their pizza too as well, order a bunch of pies and everything. So that'll be pretty cool. Uh, Excited to check out some Cincinnati area pizza since I don't think that's really anything I've really touched on in previous trips in Cincinnati. You can follow us on Instagram at Spoon Mob. Twitter, Facebook is at Spoon Mob 1. TikTok is just at Spoon Mob. Mainly everything flows through the Instagram account. So follow us there and then it kind of all gets sent out everywhere else. But that's kind of the main place where we post regular updates and new photos and everything. Check out the website, SpoonMob.com. We have profiles for everybody who's been on the podcast, whether a chef, sommelier, restaurant owner, cheesemonger, seafood purveyor, whatever. And any updates that happen since they've been on the podcast, some major updates in their career, we'll put them in there on a little written bio section that we kind of keep a running update for until they come back on the podcast and when we get to talk about that stuff with them then we'll take that part out of there because it'll all be encapsulated in a new episode and everything so we've done that a few times you know bj lieberman matt hagan stuff like that but make sure to check out all the different profiles there's photos links to all their episodes contact information social media handles all that stuff is up there you can also write in questions comments feedback Uh, if you ever wanted to submit a question to get featured on a later episode of the podcast you can do that through the contact portal or email email us directly spoonmob at yahoo.com too as well. We've had people reach out both ways. So whichever you prefer, whichever is easiest for you. And we usually write you back pretty quickly too as well when we get some time on our hands to kind of go through some of those. So Make sure to follow, subscribe to the podcast, wherever you get your podcasts from. We're on all the apps, all the players. Most everybody uses Apple because everybody in the U.S. pretty much has Apple phones and that app is already installed and super easy to use. But some people use Spotify. We're on there. Amazon Music. If you have Amazon Prime, you get a discounted subscription to Amazon Music, which is usually cheaper than Apple Music over the course of a year or so. If you're one of the people that does use Amazon Music, they do have podcasts available on there. We are on there. I use Amazon Music because it comes basically with the Prime subscription. So it's easier for me instead of having to go through another thing. But Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Samsung, if you have a Samsung phone, we're on the Samsung app. That's a 
dedicated app on your phone if you have a Samsung phone. So you can find us anywhere and everywhere, but just make sure you follow us, you know, hit the follow button. Maybe some people still use a subscribe button, but all the new episodes will just download straight into your feed. And that way, all the new episodes, when they come out, you can listen to them right away. As soon as you wake up, they're going to be there. All new episodes release on Thursdays at 1 a.m. A week later, they'll hit our YouTube channel. We'll throw them up there. So if YouTube is your preferred player, you can find us on YouTube. You're just going to be a week behind the latest episode if that's what you're using to listen to the podcast. That is it for all the updates. So without any further delay, here's my conversation with Chef David Willicks, the owner and executive chef of the Baker's Table and the Baker's Table Bakery in Newport, Kentucky. Cool. Well, thanks again for agreeing to come on the podcast and do this. We have eaten at the Baker's Table, had a great time. And it was a fall trip to Cincinnati. I don't remember if it was before COVID or that fall after COVID, but you guys had the prefix layout of the menu at that time. I think it was like a Thursday because there's like a jazz band in there for a little bit too as well. Since then, you've opened a bakery across the street and everything. I want to get into that story there, but I always start at the beginning with everybody all the way back. How did you kind of first get involved with cooking? Because originally you're from Annapolis, Maryland. So did you first get started cooking in high school, college, family involved in restaurants? It all goes back to my mother. She was a great cook. She always cooked for us. I made cookies with her. So that was like my first initial love of it. And then I have a very fascinating way that I got into cooking. I used to be a jazz musician. So I was a jazz guitar player. I have a degree in jazz guitar performance. And so I started getting into food in college, started like experimenting with like different diets, raw food, vegan, just kind of exploring food, being really interested in food. And then I moved to New York City to try to be the world's greatest jazz guitar player At that time, I also got into yoga. I started studying yoga. I became a yoga teacher. And I started going to these yoga centers where they cooked this amazing vegetarian food. And I started learning how to cook. Got burned out in New York City, moved to California. Really couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I was tired of playing music. I knew I needed to go in a different direction. And food was the only job I could get. So I started working at a cheese shop in the Sonoma Plaza. Turns out I had a good palate. And I accidentally just moved forward from there. It was very unintentional. The main reason that I did it was A, because I could find a job, and B, time passed really quickly. When I was cooking, I noticed that the hours would go by fast. On planet Earth, sometimes it's really nice that your work goes by quickly. You know, you don't feel a sense of it's dragging on and you dread it. So I noticed that cooking worked for me in a really unique way that like a lot of other things didn't. So I just kept going. So why jazz guitarists? Was that somebody in your family played instruments too as well? Like how did you kind of pursue that career for a while? I mean, like you said, you got a degree, I think from the University of Miami. What was that? Was it just something that you took to and really enjoyed? And Yeah, I have an astoundingly musical family. Both of my parents are singers. Everyone on my father's side all sang in choirs. So I grew up with Joni Mitchell and James Taylor constantly playing on vinyl in the house. I started playing drums when I was eight. I realized I couldn't sing along. So I started playing guitar at age 11. And then I got ready to leave high school. And I was like, well, what the hell am I going to do with my life? I guess I'm going to be a guitar player with my life. And that's just how it went. What led you kind of to move into New York to pursue that even further instead of Chicago's got a, as far as I know, a pretty decent jazz scene and a lot of jazz history there too. Well, I think St. Louis too, but you went to New York. So what led to that? And I think still, like New York, it's the crown jewel. It's the best of the best. And so everyone who's a young jazz musician has a fantasy that one day they're going to go to New York and make it big. And I accidentally got hooked up with a teaching job where I took over someone's uh, roster of students. So I moved to New York City, took over a roster of 60 students, immediately had a full paying job in an apartment. And I kind of like got a pretty cherry deal. So it was too good to pass up. So I went. Do you remember the moment that you kind of got burnt out on the music industry? Because we've had a couple people on this podcast who were in bands and stuff like that. They were traveling around and they can all point to one moment where they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like this isn't either it wasn't working or they just weren't really in love with the lifestyle anymore. You know, and, and that was traveling from city to city and grinding it out where you're in one place. But do you have that moment where you're like, I want to do something else? I have a memory. I was playing a gig at a bar in Jersey City, and I was aware that the whole entire time that I was playing, the only thing I was aware of is whether other people thought I was cool or not. And I was obsessed with trying to impress other people, and I was obsessed with trying to be technically fancy and virtuosic. And I realized that I wasn't enjoying what I was doing at all. I was completely in my head, and I felt like that was a really unhealthy way to approach music. And 
it wasn't good for me. And there's no way anybody actually could like what I was doing because I was just trying way too damn hard. So I realized I got to back off. This is not healthy. So then you kind of start, like you mentioned, focusing on mental health, you get into yoga. Is that what led to moving out to California was yoga and I don't want to say alternative lifestyle, but something that was more in tune with kind of mental health and the weather and cuisine and ingredients and all that stuff? If you listen to like pop music, there's a lot of songs about California. Like Joni Mitchell has a song called California. It's like really a beautiful song. And I was like, man, everybody writes songs about California. I'm 24. Fuck it. I'm out. I'm going. I'm not going to have another chance like this to just leave everything and abandon everything and just make myself new. And I just sold everything and drove across the country. I had nothing. This is where the yoga thing continues. I actually met uh, some people who ran a yoga and meditation center out there. And I went out there and I lived on their farm. You talk about a moment that changed your life. They sent me out in the farm to go pick vegetables for making dinner that night. Because at this point, they knew I cooked a little bit. And I remember going out and digging up onions. And I pulled them out of the ground and they were still warm from the sun. And then I picked kale and I picked herbs and I made dinner. And I remember blown away by the reality of touching the food in the earth, still warm from the sun, and then transmitting it into, you know, into food that people could eat. And I remember that completely blew me away. And I wanted that connection a lot more. And I think that, that that's kind of the start of me being a professional cook right there. So how did you wind up at the cheese shop? Was that somebody connected through your yoga group or? I just looked on Craigslist. I was wandering around. I was broke as a joke. I, it was a terrible moment in my life, financially speaking. And I just desperately looking for a buck. I just needed a paycheck. And then it turned out from what I could find that the guy who owned the cheese shop was like a legit cook, right? Yeah, it was actually an Israeli woman. Her name was Meek. She was my first cooking teacher. She was really cool. She taught me knife skills. She immediately tested my palate and realized that I actually had, really could taste uh, things quite well. She taught me how to make soup. She taught me how to do cheese pairings, uh, accompany wine pairings. So she was actually a great teacher. I got an opportunity to move down to Oakland. So I moved to Oakland, California after about a year. And that's when that whole journey kept going. Because now I was in a place with real big deal restaurants. Did she ever run restaurants herself, like in her kind of earlier career and stuff? I'm sure she did, but I didn't really ever find out about that. I worked with her for about six months. Once she kind of tells you like you have some natural talent, palate, shows you kind of some skills, you pick it up and everything. Did you ever consider going to culinary school? Very clearly, I started getting into cooking my mom says, Dave, you think you should go to culinary school? You take this seriously? And I said, Mom, look, I've done a little bit of research. Culinary school, let's say maybe I leave a two-year program. I owe $50,000 in debt. I've done the research. If I leave culinary school, I'm going to get hired as a salad cook. I'm going to make $11 an hour. So why don't I just get hired as a salad cook now, make $11 an hour now, and just do that on the front end instead of wasting $50,000 $50, first. So I was very sure that I wanted to do on-the-job training for this particular aspect of my life instead of investing in a college degree because I felt like it was just going to be smarter. If I was going to get shat on, I might as well do it now than later. It turned out to be correct. Knowing what you know now, operating a restaurant, running a restaurant, being in the profession for a number of years, somebody working in your kitchen now says, hey, I want to be a professional chef. I want to own my own restaurant one day. Do you think I should go to culinary school? What would you tell them? I would say no way. I'd say what you do is you find the best restaurant you possibly can find where you are the absolute most challenged and you work yourself through every single station in the entire restaurant, including management, until you're to the point where you've mastered everything. And if you find a good enough restaurant with a broad enough spectrum of capabilities and things that it specializes in, once you've exited that full maturation process, you're going to be pretty baked. Now, maybe you want to add things to your resume. Maybe you want to go do the alt MBA program online with Seth Godin. Maybe you want to go study bread baking in France. But at that point, you've really got a substantial amount of maturity and experience. And that counts for more than anything. So like you said, you moved down to Oakland. Is that the first place you wind up working? Is that S-Y-D-A, CETA, how it's pronounced? So that was another yoga and meditation center. I had uh, kept wanting to learn more about spirituality. I was learning meditation there and the head chef walked up to me and he was like, hey, Dave, are you going to come and cook with me today? And I said, yeah, man, I'll be there. And he goes, great, I quit. And then I go into this staff meeting and they're like, hey, guys, we're in a, we have a big problem. We have this celebration event where we're feeding the community. We're feeding 400 people in, in one week. Who's going to cook? And I, I raised my hand. And I was like, I'll do it. And they were like, you don't know how to do it. I'm like, I don't care. I'll figure it out. And so like, I just had this sense of like, I was going to try. And so I just put my 
myself out there I, and cooked for 350 people. Somehow I pulled it off. And then uh, I ended up becoming the head chef at that place. And that's where I learned how to make Indian vegetarian food. Uh, and that's also where our motto at the restaurant, Feed People With Love, comes from. That was what I was trained in at that place was that the most important thing that mattered was the feeling that you had. So you're cooking for all these people, you know, this big group of people, everything it goes well. You keep kind of doing it. You know, obviously they don't have giant events all the time, but still kind of you're the resident chef essentially at this yoga commune it's a retreat place but there was like 50 people who lived there full time and then they would have meditation events for the public almost every night and then they would have these big meditation retreats with like two three four five the most people i ever cooked for was 550 people is this different types of yoga is this all kind of one style is this also i've ran into some people that do like uh the silent meditation retreats too where like you don't talk like the entire like weekend and stuff like that yeah there was a lot of cooking in silence actually i would say mostly it was meditation so when you do that for a while what led you to wanting to move into a an actual restaurant i had done that for four years and all these people in the community were saying to me, David, when are you going to open your own restaurant? When are you going to open your restaurant? And I'm looking at them and I'm like, dude, I'm a hack. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Like, I can do this thing, but I've been to great restaurants in this area. I suck at cooking. I felt like a fake. And so at a certain point, I said to myself, like, I can either continue along this cush path that I've got kind of figured out or I can challenge myself. So I quit. At this point, I was 29. And I said, I got to get a job at a restaurant. I have to learn how to, at that point, I've never cooked meat before. And I had a team of like eight people that did all the prep work and I came and assembled everything. So like, I also didn't have good knife skills. So I basically just walked around and found a place that was hiring on the line. And they're like, you're 27 and you've been the executive chef of a restaurant. Why do you want to work here? And I was like, well, I need to learn. And they're like, all right, dude, whatever. I proceeded to just kind of like work at four or five places for about nine months each. I found that I would work at a place for nine months and then I would have some sort of taken what I needed from that place or I would have like a philosophical issue with the owner. I would say like, man, I can't get behind you anymore. I got out. I got to get out of here. And I think like during that time, I learned a lot about different ways of approaching, you know, station management, menu construction, how to line cook very well, how to have mental organization, verbal communication, how to manage stress, how to move quickly, like all all the, the skills, I learned a little bit at each place. And I also learned a lot of different styles. And I think that was really, really informative for me eventually becoming an entrepreneur and saying like, how can I take the best of what I learned? And how can I let go of the things that I think sucked? And how can I try to make an offering to the world of like what I think is the best restaurant that I could make? Did you purposely target different styles of restaurants to work at for those nine month periods? Like never to Italian places, never to French places or anything like that. How did you decide on those kind of four or five places that you wound up working at? I think I knew that I wanted to work in a farm to table space. I knew that I wanted to work in a space that mainly focused on Italian, French and Spanish cuisine because I felt that geographically it was closest to American cuisine. Geographically, the weather and the climate of Italy, France, and Spain is the closest to America. So I thought that those cuisines would translate to indigenous American ingredients the best. I think if you look at a, a global map, there's a lot of that where if you look at, I think it's the latitude lines, that certain ingredients just work even if they're with different countries because they're all in kind of the same climate. Yeah. Whereas like I had been cooking Indian food and I felt like there was no way I could authentically cook farm to table Indian food because the majority of the ingredients had to be imported from across the world. Indian food was out. I couldn't really specialize in Indian food. I knew that I wanted it to reflect the place that I was in. I wanted to have my life be built around a cuisine that was local to me. So I think I was looking for places that were in that space. And gradually and gradually, I got closer and closer to Chez Panisse, uh, which is the restaurant from Alice Waters. My only regret, I did one stage shift at Chez Panisse, and I ended up working for a year and change for one of her disciples. But I was too afraid to go for working for her. And that's my only culinary regret is that I wish that I had gotten to cook for her because she's my idol. Do you think that was because she was your idol and it's kind of one of those don't meet your hero type things? Or was it because you felt some sort of imposter syndrome or anything like that? But you've mentioned a couple of times where it's like you didn't think your knife skills were good enough to be in a kitchen, but then you're you know running a restaurant and, and same kind of thing with the jazz where it was like you felt not taking it serious or, or kind of showing off and just trying to instead of maybe focus on the music, trying to focus on the other aspect of it. So was that the reason or have you never really analyzed it? 
if I look back, I didn't have authentic confidence. I was slowly building it through real experience. I knew I was building confidence. The day that I staged there, there was five people volunteering. This is back before there was like this current labor shortage that we're experiencing where like, you know, they had five volunteers and they had a waiting list of 10 people to volunteer. So I was just like, honestly, like intimidated. And I didn't feel that good about my skill set yet to like walk in and be like, hey, I'd like to work for you. Let me, you know, in retrospect, I wish I had done what I described about other restaurants at Chez Panisse. I wish I had said, I'll be your fucking dishwasher. Let me work my way up. But yeah, I was a little bit afraid. So I ended up working for someone that worked for her. I didn't have that intimidation of like the 10 person wait list, but I, I learned the same culinary techniques because they cook the same way as Chez Panisse. I did get the benefit of that, but yeah, I was just afraid, man. It takes a long time to build authentic confidence. I think that you can fake confidence. You can have a big ego. The true confidence that comes from experience takes a long time to cultivate. And especially for me, it just, it just took a long time. Well, also too, is it's a lot easier for other people to shit on whatever you're trying to do or cut you down for their own lack of confidence or lack of self-awareness instead of kind of supporting you with positivity too, as well. Like that's a thing that's across any real career is like, you'll run into people and are like, why are you doing that? Or the, and it's like, well, I think I'm okay at it and I enjoy it. And they're like, you shouldn't do that. You're not good enough. When you constantly run up against those people, you know, that can be kind of deflating too, is like, all right, if everybody keeps telling you no on the side. It's kind of like, you have to believe in yourself. Otherwise you'll eventually kind of listen to them too, as well. I feel like my, the majority of my critic was inside myself. I think it's actually a strength because it meant that I wouldn't settle for my own mediocrity. Like I had such a strong drive to really be great at something that I think I was just criticizing myself. Not many people criticized me. Like I think people were very supportive of what I did. It was like inside, I knew that I could go deeper. So yeah, the, the majority of it was me. And I think ultimately a creative endeavor, you know, like opening a restaurant or even every time that you come up with a new dish, it's a creative endeavor. Um, I think that that's scary every time because you're putting a part of yourself out there. You're saying like, I think this is beautiful. I think this is good. I, I'm offering this to you. There's a vulnerability in that every time. You kind of just have to get used to it. Like it's just a little scary every time. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it though. And then after time, you kind of get hardened to the feedback aspect where you get Yelp and all that stuff. And it's like, well, whatever, you don't get it. And I have like a pretty specific relationship with feedback, too. I actually believe in soliciting feedback. I, I actually try to just completely invert the entire process. And I just actively ask for feedback immediately on a scale of one to ten. So like I'll, I'll take a new dish and I'll, and I'll hand it to my employees and I'll say, all right, cool. So this is this, this is that. Take a bite. And as they take a bite, I watch their eyes and I watch their face facial expressions. I see if when they eat the food, it makes them think. If they eat the food and then I see their eyes like thinking and they look up at the ceiling and they look inquisitive, I know the dish isn't there yet. If I hand them the dish and I watch their eyes and I watch their face and I see pleasure and like joy on their face, I know I got it. Because I think that with food, there's like, it appeals to our animal nature. And so I'm always trying to take it to the point where I bypass your mind and it hits your heart and your gut. And there's this pleasure response. You can hear it in people. They go, oh, you're going to call it sexual, whatever you want to call it. It's bypassing the mind and it's hitting like the, the animal pleasure centers in your body. And so like I specifically like solicit that. I watch their face. I say, Gala, one to 10. What was it? And I got because I want to know. So I try to hit feedback head on. Everybody needs feedback. I guess you want feedback from not just trusted people, but people that also understand what you're doing too. Like if you did that with somebody just off the street, the feedback might not be as worthwhile because they don't understand pairing ingredients with each other or building out a dish or why it's plated the way it is and stuff like that. So there are other aspects to it where I think that's the thing that a lot of restaurant owners and chefs come to terms with where you'll get anonymous feedback on Yelp that's unsolicited. And it's like, you've never worked in a restaurant you don't understand you've never taken the time to learn even just by reading or anything so it's like how much should i really put value into your feedback when you haven't taken the time to understand and learn even one tenth of what i know that's tricky i think uh, the essence of that problem is that there's a difference between feedback and shit talking you know anybody can shit talk and the majority of what you you do experience with yelp with google tends to be shit talking it tends to be this place doesn't even try this menu is terrible this food's bad what a waste so overpriced those things aren't feedback 
every once in a while, like maybe one out of 50, someone says, I felt like that experience was overpriced because I, you know, felt like the lighting and the environment didn't meet the price point of the food. And so that's actual feedback. So I think that that's the, the big thing with like the online reviewing platform is that most of it isn't feedback. So what's your opinion then on food journalism and, and food writing? Because there's, you know, that saying that those who can't do criticize or, or something along those lines. So, you know, food journalism, food reviews, that's a form of feedback, but it's also can be shit talking essentially too as well. So what's your take on that? I think that food writing is one of the most important things to the success of the restaurant industry. And this might be not the answer that you thought you were going to get from me here. I think that food writing and professional cooking are hand in hand. Uh, food writers tell the story of the restaurants and the cooks. They build trust by being honest and, you know, having a discerning perception of what, you know, is quality and not quality. And the public trusts them. Like a great food writer like, you know, Pete Wells, New York Times, he knows what's going on because he's eaten at a lot of restaurants. He's made it his life's journey. Like you, sounds like you've eaten at a lot of restaurants and you really think about these things. You've done a lot of homework on me more than anyone else I've ever talked to. So it sounds like you're thoughtful. People who are thoughtful about food, who write about food in an honest way, the public trust them. When the public trust them, if you write a good review, this restaurant explodes. You get busy. It'll make your year. It'll make your five years. It'll make your whole career. If you're terrible and you do a bad job, hopefully that critic will actually give you actionable feedback and then review you a year later, give you another chance. So yeah, I think that food writing is incredible. Um, you know, Our first year that we were open, we we're on the eater.com 18 best new restaurants in America list. That was the turning point in my professional career. I went from being kind of busy to our business uh, went up 200% in one week. It changed everything. I couldn't have done that without food writing. So I think that it's really, really important. But I, I do think that the writers need to be very, very thoughtful. How did you find your way back, find your way to the Cincinnati area from California? What led to all that? I fell in love with my wife and she lived out here. She went to Xavier and stayed and got a job. And it was clear that this was a place with more opportunity than California. California was saturated. The cost of living for a person who's in the culinary world is completely untenable. And so I came out here and I was like, oh my God, rent's affordable. Uh, I think there's space in the market, you know, to do cool things. Um, so it just it was obvious that this was a place that I could I could grow. And uh, we ended up buying a house in Newport. People kept saying to me, when are you going to open a restaurant? When are you going to open a restaurant? And I was like, man, I can't open a restaurant. I'm 32. And then I, you know, my wife found out she was pregnant. And I was like, OK, I'm opening a restaurant. Because I knew that, you know, the only way I was going to be able to really support a family long term was if, you know, if I was an entrepreneur. Now, the first couple of years of that kind of rough, but you're building a business that hopefully is going to sustain you financially for the long term. But before you opened the restaurant, you started kind of a catering business, right? You were doing like in-home dining, private events, catering and stuff. Yeah, I did a bunch of stuff. I worked for Jose Salazar at Salazar Restaurant, at Mita's Restaurant. I left there. I was on the opening team of Alay Bakery in OTR. I knew I wanted to work with bread. I knew bread was going to be central to my business concept. I wanted to make 100% of my bread. So I worked there. And then I left. I sold like pastries to cafe cafes. And I started doing pop-up events in my home. I did them at some local spots. I did them at our favorite farmer, uh, Annie Woods, at her farm, Darkwood Farms. So yeah, we did a bunch of events in the year of 2018, signed a lease for the Baker's Table restaurant on Monmouth Street in uh, June, and then we opened in December. So the time frame in this whole thing was like crazy. During that whole time, my wife was pregnant, by the way, and she gave birth in September and the restaurant opened in December. So my daughter was three months old. It was wild. And she designed the restaurant, right? Yeah, she's actually a humanities teacher. She she teaches creative writing in the humanities, and she just happens to have a ridiculous eye for design. And she designs our home, she designs our businesses, and she doesn't design for a living, though. She doesn't want to. Every chef has that thing that hooks them, whether it's they gravitate towards pasta or meat and butchery or whatever. So what was it about bread for you? Was it working with your hands? You're also spending so much time within the yoga community and a good chunk of that community is pretty anti-bread. That's a great point. You know, when I was in California, a couple of places I went to made their own bread and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And I just was really intrigued by it because I honestly just loved eating it. I went to this place, it was called Pizzaiolo. It was the sister restaurant of the place that I worked. They had this cafe service in the morning and actually that cafe service became the inspiration for the bakery. They made their own bread. They pulled them out of the pizza oven and then you could have toast with house-made jam, espresso drinks, 
a couple of pastries. It was like insanely cool. I used to go like twice a week. It was the best. And so I just would watch the guy make bread. And I would just hang out, drink a cappuccino and watch him make bread. And I just got into it. And then I tried to do it on my own. And I was like, damn, this is hard. From that moment of me getting hooked to when, you know, I opened the restaurant was probably about three years. It took me another three and a half years to really, really get our bread where I think it should have been. So it's been like an eight-year journey. So it all started uh, selfishly. I loved eating bread, and I wanted to have it available all the time. <laughs> and I think in a lot of the ways, for me as a culinarian, that's where it came from. So I, I freaking love food, man. And I, and I don't want to rely on somebody else. What if they don't cook it the way I like, In a way, it's, it's been a selfish pursuit in a way because I just love food. When you're doing kind of the events and the pop-up and everything before you actually open the restaurant, looking back on that, was there a big takeaway from that? Whether it was it gave you time to kind of develop your menu or your style that you were going to incorporate in the restaurant or just logistics and figuring out kind of all that stuff and what you need and what you didn't? A big thing that we did was come up with a name. The name The Baker's Table. Uh, there was a gentleman. He was a baker. His name was Jean Paul. He had a bakery called Paradiso in Anderson Township in Cincinnati. And he got sick and he was selling all of his things and uh, went in and looked through everything. And I saw this incredible table. It was 10 feet long. He had been baking on it for 25 years. I was like, this is insane. And he sold me that table. A uh, funny story. He quizzed me before he would sell me the table, though. He said, you know, what are you going to make on my table? And I was like, this is, I don't know, scones. He's like, what flavor of scones are you going to make? And I was like, currant and orange zest. And he goes, what are you going to do to the currants? And I was like, I'm probably going to soak them in boiling hot water and sugar before I put them into the scones so they're not too dry that they don't dehydrate the scone. He goes, okay, you can buy the table. So he, he like quizzed me uh, to make sure it's reasonable. He, he was passing down his life's work to me in a way. That was one of the things that happened during that year. And I think, you know, I started developing my style, which, you know, I, I don't even know what, what to call my style. It, I call it rustic seasonal cuisine. It's really just me seeing what the farmers are producing and challenging myself to come up with something cool with that. I think that's really the essence of, of what I do and what, you know, my chef Porter and I do is we invert the creative process. We don't say, okay, I would like to make a beef bourguignon with asparagus. Let me go find asparagus. I think that's the way the conventional food system works when it decides what it's going to put on a menu. Um, we just invert that process. We say, okay, Farmer Annie, what do you got coming in next week? Okay, you got uh, you got turnips. You got this, you got that. Okay, so what menu can we write that's going to be relatable for people to work with what we've got? And so that's, I started just kind of developing that and realized that we wanted to start out focusing on brunch. Um, and that was literally so I could get home and see my daughter. That was the only reason we did brunch. I was going to ask that because it's a weird thing to start a restaurant and then you're only open for like breakfast and lunch service and not dinner. I wanted to try to have a, a family life for the first year of my daughter's existence. And I was afraid that I would never see her otherwise. So yeah, that was the original idea was we would be a daytime restaurant. And I think that's part of the reason we managed to land on the national scene so fast is we have a daytime restaurant. It sources almost exclusively local produce. It makes 100% of its bread. There's not a lot of places in the country that are doing that. And so immediately I was in this like very small micro market. In the business world, you'd call that a unique selling proposal. You know, that was our concept. When you find the space for the restaurant, did you purposely want to be on that side of the river? Yeah, I felt really strongly that I, I was very scared about running a restaurant profitability financial wise, because a lot of the places that I had worked before, you know, I would get to the point where I would like, you know, have a conversation with the chef and be like, so cool. So can we talk about, you know, business? Like, are you making money? How much money are you making for my personal future? Is owning a restaurant something that I can do to support my family? And I remember consistently, they'd be like, we're barely making 1% profit. Shut up. And I was like, damn. And after digging further, I found out they were all in bad leases. Uh, so they were all getting gouged on their rent. And because they were getting gouged on their rent, their operating expenses were really, really high. It made it really, really hard to function because, you know, if you're sourcing great produce, your cost of goods are going to be high. If you're paying your employees a living wage and you're you're helping them to have a real life balance, your labor costs are going to be high. So if your labor's high, food's high, and your operating expenses are high, you've created a money pit. So I realized that I needed to have rent be on my advantage. I, I went to downtown Cincinnati. I had a couple of meetings with 3CDC. I saw the deal they were they were pushing on the table and I laughed. I was like, you got to be freaking kidding me, man. No one can make money with that deal. You are stringing people up. And so I, 
I walked away and ended up finding the spot in Newport. And it wasn't where I wanted to be. It was further away than I wanted to be. But I had unbelievably great rent. And I ended up getting a purchase deal on the building built into my lease. I felt that owning my own building was going to be a really important part of, of succeeding for the long term. So that's why we were in Newport, because I lived here and I got ridiculously good rent. Was the space pretty much turnkey or do you guys have to do a lot of construction to it? Oh my God, it was bad. It, these people who owned the place before were, it was like the culinary version of a slumlord. I mean, it was awful. I like, don't even want to give details because it was really upsetting. I spent, I don't even know how many hours cleaning, cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and then cleaning again. And then cleaning. I did was, so yeah, it, it took a huge amount of effort. My father and my mother and I were working like 65 hours a week getting the place ready. You mentioned, you know, you kind of, after you guys open, I think you guys opened December, 2018. And then like half a year later, you know, the eater article comes out. You're one of like the 16 best new restaurants in America. How did you guys find out that you were on that list? Did they give you a heads up or did you just like get a bunch of messages from people? I got contacted by someone who was a food writer for Eater. I honestly didn't even know what Eater was, <laughs> which is kind of embarrassing. But I was like, oh, someone who's a food writer for this company wants to stop by and talk to me. OK, cool. And I looked and I was like, oh, Eater has 18.5 million followers on Instagram. I probably should pay attention. So she came, had lunch. My wife and my daughter and I sat down and hung out with her and her husband for like a half an hour. We just had a great time. And I remember very clearly, uh, I walked into the kitchen. I said, there's a national food writer in the dining room, but there's no VIPs in our restaurant. So I'm not going to tell you what table they're at. And I don't want you to tense your body. I don't want you to get anxious. I don't want you to freak out. We just cook like we cook and we don't worry about who's in the dining room. Just be yourself. And I did the same thing. And we just, you know, we're cool. I got an email saying, you know, we just want to fact check a couple pieces of information. So at this point, I'm thinking they're doing like a Cincinnati roundup. Look, like, I don't know what it is. I'm like, oh, maybe there's like a Midwest brunch spot article they're running. And then that morning, I, I open up Instagram and Eater pops up and I see my freaking name and my freaking fried chicken sandwich on their slideshow. It's like an avalanche. It was insane. So when that comes out, did you guys have a reservation system at that point? Did you have to install one? Because you guys hired additional staff like after that, right? I mean, I think at that point we had been using reservations on Resi. And so, you know, at that point, like we were doing pretty good. We went from being like doing pretty good to like I had to have a host starting at 8 a.m. And we would have an, a wait list. Sometimes the wait list was like four and a half hours. Sometimes you'd have to turn people away at 11 because you're like, you're not going to get a table before we're closed, man. <laughs> it was crazy. Well, then two months later, I think USA Today puts you guys on their best new restaurants list too as well. So was it kind of the same process? Once you get to that level, all the media outlets are talking to each other and they're paying, to each other, paying attention to each other. And so if someone breaks a new concept, everyone pays attention to that new concept. And so it's really easy to popcorn at that point. They just, I'm sure, picked up on the eater thing and then, and then got us on for that. At that point, was dinner service already in the works? Like that was something you were going to implement anyways, or did the publicity force you to do that? It was, you know, interestingly enough, we were busier than we ever dreamed of, but brunch is a terrible business model. It was crazy. We were so busy, but we weren't making money because the average, you know, amount that each person was paying was so low and it required us to staff so many people to feed everybody. You know, I have a 45 seat restaurant. Our record was 323 people in one service. That means we turned every chair six times and we still weren't making money. So it was really uh, shocking to me. I couldn't have predicted that. You know, everyone thinks that brunch is a cash cow, but we really struggled. So then we opened dinner, honestly, because we had to. Which sounds crazy because everybody thinks that like when restaurants are busy, that like it's perfect. And it is a blessing. Like it is a big blessing. But from a fiducial standpoint, like just because you're busy doesn't mean it's working. <laughs> Yeah, at that time, we already knew we needed an uh, open dinner. And so I used the USA Today article as an opportunity to launch it. We launched dinner. We were open for four months. It was like booming. And then my mom called me up and says, there's this global disaster coming. You better watch out. And I was like, mom, I'm on the top of the world. Everything's going to be great. And she's like, you better watch out. It's coming right now. And then COVID happened. And uh, our sales dropped 75% in one month. You guys closed for a couple months, right? Because of COVID? Yeah, we closed for two weeks and then we reopened doing takeout only. And we did takeout only through the winter and July, we were able to kind of reopen a little bit and we actually fed people outside on the sidewalk. How close was the restaurant to essentially closing permanently? Because you, like you said, up to that point, when you guys are doing brunch, you're not really making any money. Dinner service was only around for six months or so. Was that enough time to build up at least enough to where you guys could make it through? We built up a pretty good cushion, but we burned through it and got a blink of an eye. 
the only reason that, that we're still here is because of my parents. They went to school on PPP funding. They took every freaking online seminar they could find. They took every EIDL online training thing. That was their full-time job was getting us those PPP dollars. And that's the only reason we're still here. I think you guys kind of reopened in like July that summer. Was that out of necessity, responsibilities to the community? You know, we're a restaurant that it was all about, you know, the heart. It was all about people. It was all, all about connecting with the community. It was all about, it was honestly all about like energy. We sucked as a takeout restaurant. I just generally thought that what we were doing, like didn't fit what we were about and like we weren't doing a good job. And so we definitely reopened because like, you know, that's what we know how to do. What I've learned now and how I've grown, like maybe I could have done a better job as a business owner during the pandemic, but like I didn't want to run a takeout restaurant. That's why I opened the restaurant I opened. We didn't do takeout. Like if you walked up to the bar and, you know, asked if you could order an egg sandwich to go, like depending on how busy it was, they might tell you no, because the kitchen would be just too backed up. We couldn't do it. We went from, we don't do takeout. I'm so sorry to trying to force ourselves into a, a box that it, it didn't work. We really had a hard time during COVID. It, it was something that I know a lot of other places struggle with too. That was their same reality. Whose idea was the outside tents in the winter? It was just utter and sheer desperation, right? Like, can we figure out any way to stay alive? We served New Year's Eve dinner under the tent. We had six tables and it was three degrees outside. We had six propane space heaters inside the tent. We had blankets on the chairs. It was freaking nuts. We served complimentary hot toddies and <laughs> complimentary tea with lemon. It was just like anything we could do. Did you have to get a permit for that? Yeah. Was that easy or was that hard? I had to sign up for a temporary lease from the county building. The parking lot's in there lost. It was like I had to sign up for a temporary lease. We Our first tent exploded and fell apart, and we got in our second tent. Our second tent collapsed New Year's Day. From just like the weather, wind, and stuff? Apparently, it wasn't a good tent. It was right then that we created the idea of the pre menu because we had to open inside because the tent broke. We could only seat 12 people in the freaking dining room. No one was vaccinated at this point. So me, you know, Captain, you know, body health awareness, we're going to open our front window three inches. I need airflow in this building. <laughs> it was like we served Valentine's Eve dinner with the front window open, and the heaters were on 100%. And we told everybody it was going to be happening. We told them to bring jackets. And we again, we gave complimentary hot everything. It was just like the kind of stuff you never could have written in a trillion years if you, you know, dreamed it up. But what we created was like, you know, if we're going to have 12 seats, we have to have a dining style where people can't share a Caesar salad. If you have 12 seats, maybe you can seat the whole entire dining room two and a half times. That puts you at what, about 30 reservations for the night? So if you have only 30 available reservations, you have to get as many dollars from each seat as you possibly can in order to survive. The old reality of like people coming in and sharing a pasta and sharing a salad was gone. We couldn't do it anymore. Also, those people were always unhappy. They shared a salad and they shared a pasta and they told us that they were hungry at the end. And we were like, yeah, we know you shouldn't have done that. So we decided, you know, like, what if we create a dining style that, that shows people the ideal for how to eat at our restaurant? And what if it not only helps them, but if it also helps us, we make more money and you have a better time because you're going to eat the amount of food that's actually going to satisfy you and nourish you. You're going to try as much as possible this dynamically rotating seasonal menu. At this time, we started butchering only whole animals too. So you talked about like, you know, the interest in, in butchery. So at that point, we had been making 100% of our pasta since day one. And Chef Porter and I, who's my friend from Oakland who runs the restaurant now, we should just do whole animals, man. We should just do it. So we only have 30 covers. Like we should just go for it. So he just buys a lamb and we just go whole lambs, whole ducks, whole chickens, whole fish. It's been a hard time getting whole pigs lately, but whole pigs. We realized that it was a dining style that we really thought was beautiful and we liked serving it and the kitchen was much more efficient and our guests were happier. And so we just stuck with it. We're still doing it. What led to the idea to open the bakery? Was it you needed more space? The space across the street was just an opportunity? Like how'd that come about? You know, we're a restaurant called The Baker's Table, and I'm trying to bake bread out of this kitchen with a convection oven, and we're baking out of the cast iron pans, and I'm just like, this is not scalable. If I get as busy as I was before, after COVID rebounds, I cannot keep this up. There's no way we can keep doing this. So if we're going to be The Baker's Table, if we're going to live this name, I got to have a bake. Otherwise, I'm just going to be making like crappy, not as good as it could be bread. And, and we've already discussed how I, I'm not able to tolerate mediocrity. <laughs> I started thinking that a bakery was probably going to be in my future. I had worked as a pizzaiolo. I worked as a pizza cook a couple of times. And I immediately, I'm just like, if I'm going to bake bread in the morning, if I got a hot oven, that means I got pizza at night. So I immediately just like knew it was going to have to be bakery in the morning, pizza at night. Yeah, I just kept watching that building across the street. Incidentally, it was actually the day that the uh, flipping 
other tent collapsed. My friend who was the, now my landlord, uh, he said, hey, Dave, I just got an inquiry for someone who wants to open a bakery in this building. Are you in or not? And I was like, man, I'm not ready, but yeah, let's do it. I just didn't want anybody else to move in across the street and do the same concept I was going to do, but do it worse. You wanted to, in the ideal world before you were kind of pushed into that, though, you still wanted the bakery to be relatively close to the restaurant, though, right? Yeah, I was thinking that that might be the right spot. I like the idea of proximity, of having like my own little village. So it's cool because staff members can walk across the street, you know, get stuff. They can work at both places, pass ingredients across the street. We can, you know, if one place is really busy, you can go prep at the other. It's like it works pretty well. It's pretty cool. That model works for Grant Ackett's in Chicago. That works for Thomas Keller. He's got everything on the same street out in Yountville. So like it's it's a proven concept for sure. When you're opening, you know, the bakery, for you, was it more about perfecting the bread program or creating jobs through expansion and growth opportunity for everybody that was within the restaurant? One of the initial ideas was that they would come to brunch and they would come to dinner and we wouldn't have space. And I'm in the middle of Newport, kind of like in the north side of Newport. There's no place to go. You know, unfortunately, there's not like any sort of, you know, pure uh, spots that are right nearby for someone to just go chill out while they're waiting, at, you know, an hour for a table. So I actually opened it in a way as an overflow. So people could have like this circular energy where, you know, like show up early for your reservation, go have a glass of wine at the bakery, come back across the street, eat at your reservation, love the bread, walk across the street, buy a loaf of bread, take it home. I envision this circular energy flow across the two spaces where they complemented each other. The restaurant being more upscale now and the bakery being more casual. But like, I wanted people to have more reasons to be here. As time went by, you know, we decided we we're going to make bread. At this time, everyone in the whole freaking country is making bread at home, right? Because like everyone was bored during COVID and they started baking. And I'm looking at people on Instagram and I'm like, how are we going to stand out? How am I going to do something that's different than what everyone else is doing? And I started thinking about farm to table and I started looking at my own you know, world and I realized I pay attention to vegetables. I pay attention to meat. Why am I not paying attention to flour? Why, why are we missing flour here? And I think that as a culture and as a country, we are completely missing flour. So I just applied the same principles that I was applying to every other aspect of my restaurant flour. And I realized that I was completely off, you know, and I'm not talking smack. I was using King Arthur bread flour. Well, everybody in the entire country can use King Arthur bread flour. And if you think about the concept of terroir with wine, right? Because at this point I was really into wine. Terroir is all about what does the place have to say? Well, if I'm using King Arthur flour that everybody can use across the whole entire country, I'm not saying anything about place. So I started a journey to try to find local flour. This took me about a year. As soon as like before I even opened the bakery, I started on a journey to find who was growing and milling local flour. What did local flour look like? I couldn't find anybody. I thought this was my thing. This was going to be my thing. And, you know, as we speak, like, I still don't think the general populace has any idea of what we're doing. And I'm hoping that like in one, two, three years, they're going to catch on and be like, holy crap, this bakery is making 100% of its bread from locally grown, stone ground, whole grain, 100% organic flour that's grown 300 miles outside of Cincinnati. Everything, including the cookies. So I think at some point, like people are going to catch on to that. But right now it's just, we're over there, we're making bread, we're making pizza, we're making great stuff. We're doing it in a way that feels authentic to the intention, you know, because if you're going to feed people with love, right? Like that's our mission. Feed people with love. What are you going to do? What, is, what does that mean for you? Well, you got to use good ingredients. When I took that conversation to the fullness, and we pay a lot more for that flour, and it's a pain in the butt. It took us eight months to figure out how to bake with it. How was the initial reception when the bakery opened? It was great. I think our whole timeline was kind of like completely wacky because of COVID. My branding arrived like three weeks after we opened. I wasn't able to get my building painted with my sign on it for four months after I opened. My oven was like three, four weeks late. We didn't have enough time to test. So I think like, you know, to be honest with you, like we needed more time, but we just didn't have it. And at that point, all my potential employees had already given notice. And once you make a commitment as an employer to pay someone's livelihood, like you got to freaking do it. So we just went for it and we just felt into it. The bakery has been just one constant journey of evolution of what can we do here that works here? What can we do that our customers want? What can we do that inspires us and makes us excited and makes us proud? What can we do here that we feel like a powerful statement to food culture in America? And it's a journey, man. Like every day that place is changing right now. Hopefully it's not too sporadic and crazy. It's definitely constantly growing and evolving. What's the one baked good that you're the most proud of? Uh, our donuts are, I would say, top three in the country. This woman, her name is uh, Sarah Ouellette. Humorously, her Instagram handle is Donut Spanker. She just popped in the front door one day and was like, hey, can I work with you guys? And she's moved up to be our head baker now. 
the name Donut Spanker is not a joke, man. She's serious. The donuts are out of this world. I'm like, I think she ran one last week that was like matcha pastry cream, matcha glaze, chocolate cookie crumbles, chocolate sauce. And she makes everything. She's making everything from scratch. And so like, it's insane. So the donuts are insane. Really proud of the pizza. I think the pizza is world class. And I think our bread is me. So like, I think pizza, bread, donuts are probably like the three things for me that are like, that's what I'm trying to hang my hat on. Cincinnati has a handful of top notch, top quality bakeries. Even if you just go to the Cincinnati area, there's a handful of you guys. Is that collaborative environment, competitive, somewhere in between? I don't think it's any of those things. I think that they're all in their own spaces geographically. They're all in their own spaces in terms of market share. You know, 16 Bricks is the the biggest and they have a ridiculously huge facility and they make bread for wholesale and they can operate at scale. They get truckloads of flour. Alay Bakery, which is where I used to work, is an OTR. They're in a completely different demographic. They don't make pizza. So I think like we're all niched out enough that we're not in each other's way. And we're all also kind of like not doing what each other are doing. Like we're all intentionally, I mean, I'm the newest kid on the block. So the onus is on me to carve out my own space. But I think we're all kind of like doing our own things in such a way that we're like not really in each other's way. How challenging was staffing for, you know, you're opening this bakery, COVID's still around. A lot of people left the industry, whether they were forced out or they were already headed out, COVID, you know, lost jobs and stuff. And some people didn't come back, found other industries or whatever. So how challenging was that to staff at that time? And how were you able to kind of overcome it? Yeah, well, we actually had to make a really weird decision, which was we decided to pause brunch indefinitely at the restaurant because I did not have the labor force to run dinner at the restaurant, brunch at the restaurant, AM bakery at the bakery and pizzeria at the bakery, right? So it's for what we would call in the industry, like four services, operating four services. I didn't have the labor force to operate for, you know, brunch has its woes fiscally. And I'm like, okay, what do I know for sure? The restaurant dinner is doing beautifully. I know I'm opening a bakery, which means I have to be open in the morning. I don't know how you're going to be a bakery and not be open in the morning. And I knew the business model of the bakery required pizza as well to support it. So I just made the decision I had to pause for which like our diehard fans, like I think just curse me to this day because people love our brunch. We're really good at it. It's beautiful. So that was like the biggest labor crunch was like, I just didn't have enough people. And I still don't, you know, we're thinking in 2023, we can put together some sort of scenario where we can reopen a brunch service, whether that's brunch and lunch or it's brunch and additional dinner shifts. We're not really sure yet, but like we would like to do that because we love our community. People want brunch from us. We want to give it to them. You know, we're going to try to find a way to make it work. But you know, the, the biggest surprise of the labor thing for me, we would advertise for a job. And I will tell you, we would get one sixth the number of replies that we used to get. I'm saying like, if I used to advertise a job and get 20 applicants or 10 applicants, maybe I get two. The majority of them would be not qualified at all. But I'll tell you the one thing that I was shocked with and I was blown away with. If we were just patient, someone would come through who was a freaking diamond. As much as we wouldn't get a lot of applicants, the people who we would finally end up hiring would be best people. Like, I am so blown away with how good our team is right now. It's like crazy to me how good our team is right now. You have less applicants, but the ones that would finally find us, they found us because we're over there shouting from the rooftops. We care about sustainable food. We care about people. We don't believe in racism. We don't believe in sexism. We value, you know, gender equality. Like, like we're over there like trying to just like say that we're a principles-based establishment. And I think that that helps a couple of really, really, really talented people who care a lot find us. And so we're in the most beautiful space with labor that we've been in ever, which is really a surprise. The staffing stuff hasn't really changed. Like even up here, there's new concepts being open and stuff like that. And and there's some people you talk to and it's they're like, yeah, it took us forever to get fully staffed because everybody's looking for people. So they have options as to where do I want to work? What environment do I want to be in? Do I want to be at the cutting edge restaurant? Do I want to have a, a solid work environment that everybody cares about everybody? Do I want to work for the guy who's doing all the crazy stuff, but maybe isn't like the best person, you know, has had some issues in the past. So like they have options now where before they didn't. Since reopening everything, you guys have done some guest chef dinners. I think Jordan Anthony Brown did one there. Chris O'Hearn might have done the wine from Parcel Wine. 
You've done some pizza throwdown series. So was that all just born out of wanting to offer something else to, you know, your core group of customers or was that just collaboration or, you know, what kind of led to wanting to do all those things? Yeah, I think that what happened with that, and we're still on that point. And actually, if you fast forward to 2023, you're going to see more of that from us. And you're actually going to see a lot more of it at the bakery. Um, We're going to do a lot more pizza events because I think there's a lot of fun stuff we can do over there at night. So I think events are going to be coming more and more from us. And I think that the main place that came from is that COVID made everybody really lonely, man. We couldn't hang out with each other. Cooks couldn't go get a beer and just like chill. That's like, well, man, in this industry, like, I don't know what other industries are like, because I haven't really spent much time as a professional, but like you get finished your dinner shift, everybody's going to the dive bar, you're playing pool, you're drinking high life until two in the morning. That's what we do. We were all isolated. If we did see each other, we had to wear masks. We couldn't touch each other. We were afraid of each other. Like it was almost like our friends became weaponized against us. And that was a very scary experience. And so like, I think that, you know, coming out of this, when people started having vaccines, like there was just a a very genuine desire for connection. There was a genuine desire to hang out with people that were our friends and be creative together because collaboration stopped during COVID. Unless you were doing like electronic collaboration, you couldn't collaborate really. It all just came out of the desire to make something beautiful with other people. I felt alone. And I think we all did. So I think it's a healing process, like coming together in community, making beautiful food, featuring beautiful food, teaching each other about it, bringing in friends that we, you know, other people may not have met before, you know, like introducing people to other perspectives, other styles. It's kind of like medicine for our souls right now. With pizza, what style kind of works in Cincinnati? You know, there is no Cincinnati style pizza where it was like Columbus, Detroit, New York, all that stuff. But there's a lot of German heritage in Cincinnati. So does that affect the pizza style or is just kind of anything work as long as it's quality? I told you about the constant evolution. The pizza program's in a constant evolution because I'm, I'm asking myself that same question every day. I know that farm vegetables, having a center seat is at the core of what I want to do. I know that, you know, whole animals butchered in house, that's at the core of what I want. You know, we make our own sausage from pork shoulders that we butcher. I know that I want the crust to feature our bread. So it, we approach our pizza dough in the same way that we approach our bread, sourdough fermentation, all that kind of stuff. But how it's presented, I think, is actually kind of playful. It's kind of open for discussion. Is it slices? When I first opened, I was like, I'm not going to do slices. Now I'm starting to think oh, we're going to do slices at lunchtime because the slice is like incredibly quick, incredibly fast. It's it's a low commitment experience. You know, before we've only been selling whole pizzas and, you know, like I'm much more likely to just grab a slice and a soda and just get out in like 10 minutes if I know it's easy. It's not a big commitment. So yeah, we're like experimenting with slices at lunchtime. You know, at nighttime, we'll see what happens. We're kind of just like always experimenting because like I want people to be able to try as many flavors as they possibly can. Because like sometimes we put some crazy stuff on pizzas. We had one pizza that I jovially called Flavors of Schnitzel. Uh, Speaking of Germanic heritage, uh, we ended up with a whole bunch of ham by accident. And I was like, well, what are we going to put on this thing? I'm like, well, let's, let's put mustard cream on the bottom. Okay, what else do I have? I got a lot of apples right now. We're going to put apples on. Okay, this is reminding me of schnitzel. Let's do ham. What do we have? Caramelized onions. We have gouda. So I'm like, at this point, building a pizza that tastes like a schnitzel. That's a crazy pizza. And so we have a lot of fun. You know, what does Cincinnati pizza look like? Boy, I hope in 10 years we have like a kind of a fun idea. I think St. Francis of Pizza and I are both kind of like doing a lot of wild, fun stuff. And I think that we'll have gotten somewhere in about five years. You're pretty big on reducing food waste. Has that gotten better across the industry or did that all kind of revert back to the way it was because of COVID and just the need for restaurants to survive where people had to use styrofoam takeout containers, which are not biodegradable or anything like that? Like, have people gotten back into making food waste, you know, a priority or is that still kind of on the back burner because of survivorship? I think there's two questions inherent in what you just said. Number one is, are people prioritizing sustainability in their packaging choices? And my answer to that is like, sometimes we are a plastic wrap free restaurant. We don't even use plastic wrap in the damn kitchen. And that's a very conscious choice on my part. And it's something I have to police 24 seven because everybody wants to use plastic wrap and because it's easy. But I'm like, you know, the ocean doesn't think it's easy. Our takeout wear is 100% compost. So it's definitely something that we prioritize. And I know that I as a diner, I will choose to eat at restaurants because they have compostable packaging. Because I frankly hate the feeling of throwing styrofoam away. It makes me sad. So I think like, yes, I hope that more and more places are thinking about sustainability in their packaging because it's important. And I'm sure other consumers are making choices based on it besides me. And then in terms of restaurant waste, that's a great question. I think I feel like that's almost like an internal financial thing, too, because food waste is intricately related to like, what's your food cost? Your food cost is intricately related to whether you're making money or losing money. 
I definitely can't speak to anybody else about that. I definitely really wish more restaurants were recycling. I definitely know like a lot of places I go into them and I see like, you know, they're just throwing everything in the trash can. That makes me want to cry. Yeah. Unfortunately, the recycling is a, a big issue because now that China doesn't buy it, like up in Cleveland, I mean, maybe a year or so ago, there was like a, a news thing that came out and they're basically like, yeah, everything just goes into the landfill now because nobody will take it. It's unfortunately outside of my purview as a cook. I don't know how to fix that part of the industry. Hopefully, as time goes by, I can help pressure other people around me to make more sustainable choices. And hopefully, they're going to figure out recycling because it's in order for us to survive as a species, we have to figure out how to reutilize our resources. And if we're just using them once and getting rid of them, then we got a short trip off a plank. Would you want your restaurants to become like zero carbon footprint? Is that something that you'd aspire to or is that just not even like possible like you can get close to that mark but getting all the way there is yeah i can tell you that uh we bought our building and we have converted the outside area into sort of like an eco park garden so we're growing our own herbs and tomatoes and stuff like that and our dining room staff like this is again the staff being incredible they did the whole thing they're going to plant all these butterfly positive plant types they have this whole very very thorough plan and something I started thinking about is like, well, okay, so what does it look like if we move towards a zero emission restaurant concept? What does that look like? Do we put solar panels on the roof? Do we have solar hot water? It's something I've started thinking about. I think the main question is also like, what does the kitchen look like? How do we cook without relying on gasoline? natural gas. So that's something that Chef Porter and I talk about. It's like, you know, if we fast forward our lives in 10 years and the price of gas is way higher because, you know, whatever has happened with OPEC, like how are we going to be able to keep cooking? We think we're moving towards live fire. Trees are a sustainable resource if they're harvested properly. We think doing our protein cookery with live fire is where we're headed. And uh, we probably think we're headed towards induction burners. Electric for the things in that space and then live fire for the things that need to move. So I think we do spend a lot of time thinking about what does a sustainable restaurant look like in 10 years? And how can we set ourselves up for that? What do you enjoy more these days, cooking or baking? I am very overjoyed with my decision to open both places because they complement each other. You know, the restaurant is more formal. The bakery is more wacky and fun. The restaurant, the cooking is more like I get to saute. I get to roast. I get to make pasta. The bakery, I get to... I feel like I don't like one more than the other. I feel like they're both um, a respite and a beautiful contrast from each other. So my favorite thing is I just go back and forth to wherever I'm needed. And usually I get to do something fun that I haven't gotten to do in a while. I'm just generally tickled because I, I do love cooking and I love baking and I love pouring wine table side and I love doing all kinds of fun stuff. And so the, it's, it's almost like my own little playground where I always get to do stuff do something fun and new. Since you've been involved in the food and restaurant industry in the Cincinnati market, Cincinnati area, how has that changed since you know you first got into it? What do you think still needs to change and where do you think it's headed? I actually opened the restaurant, the baker's table, because I didn't see the kind of restaurants that I wanted in town to eat at. And I, again, <laughs> did something for my own self. I was like, if I, if I don't see places that I necessarily want to spend a lot of time eating at, maybe I should open my own. I think that the Cincinnati food market is, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 years behind major markets like New York City, Chicago, LA, and San Francisco. Um, I think it's just the nature of the kind of city it is. And I think that the most exciting thing that's happening is because of COVID, people like me, like Jordan Anthony Brown, events from Mochico, Eric and Elaine, um, who else? The list goes on and on. Chris O'Hearn, my friend who owns Parcel Wines, he's from San Francisco. You're starting to see all these people um, migrate out of main cities and come back home to the Midwest where they have more financial opportunity, but they're bringing with them the mindset and the skills and the talent and the vibe and the style from those main cities. And so I think that's what's most exciting about the Cincinnati market right now is you're starting to see us open spots. That's me. That's Cafe Mochico. They just got James Beard nom. They just got on the Bon Appetit list. <clears throat> Jordan Anthony Brown's going to open the Aperture. That's going to be galactic. It's going to be huge. I won't be surprised if he's on those lists. Not at all surprised. And so the more that we're getting that fresh perspective, I think that, you know, and I might get Instagram railed for this, but Cincinnati was almost like, it was kind of like a culinarily inbred town when I got here. People came up working for restaurant groups. They learned that restaurant style and then they opened their restaurant doing that same style and they never left town to learn other perspectives. And so they were just sort of like cooking the same way circularly. And I don't think that's that exciting. The fresh perspective shakes it up. That's one of the things here in Columbus, like we've started getting people coming to Columbus from like outside of the markets. You get different ideas, you get different perspectives, you get different techniques. 
flavors because they come in with different ingredients or pairings that people weren't using before and stuff too. And it kind of like a rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. I would agree. That's what is exciting for me. My main goal, my main wish is that I inspire the other restaurants in this town to really, really, really commit themselves to local and seasonal sourcing. It's really hard. In the wintertime in this town, it's, it's hard. If you, the only reason we get through it is that I have a larder. I'm going to say it's probably five to eight thousand dollars worth of summer produce that we put away. We froze fruit. We made pickles. We preserve like psychopaths in the summertime. My team is like, you got another five cases of blueberries? You got to be freaking kidding me. And I'm like, dude, in March, you're going to thank me. Like, so it's really, really hard because it's hard. Most people don't want to do it. But I believe that that's beautiful cooking. That's inspiring cooking. And we need to teach the people in our community also to expect the same thing from the grocery store when they go from Kroger. I want, you know, these local grocery stores to carry local produce instead of like whatever it is that they're doing which is not that. So, you know, that's like, you know, so you say, Dave, what's your mission? It's to inspire people to eat what's from around here and give themselves to that because I think it makes you more healthy. I think it's healthier for the earth. I think it's frankly way more exciting. What's kind of next for you professionally? Obviously, you know, you just opened the bakery not too long ago. So getting that dialed in and perfected and obviously have the baker's table, but is there anything else on the horizon that you're working on? I say 2023, getting the bakery dialed in is crucial. Getting back to profitability across my restaurant groups is is actually my only goal in life, other than having a beautiful family. But uh, we're going to start really focusing on education. You know, I talked to you about my intentions with food culture. I don't have the ability to teach cooking classes. I've thought about it a lot. Uh, I like it, but it's too hard. So we're going to start doing some online cooking series, get a YouTube channel going, share with people some of the ways that we approach food and share that and then start working on manuscripts for cookbooks. I think I got probably five cookbooks in me. Continuing to do fun events and just like explore, do great stuff, and then education. I think education is really like the way forward for us as like a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 year legacy restaurant, hopefully. This next question comes from previous guests on the podcast, Chef Brendan Miller, who's one of the co-executive chefs at Jollity in Dayton, Ohio. He left behind for you. What local restaurant have you had your best burger at? Oh, that's a sad one. My friend Jimmy, he ran OTR Chili and Jimmy didn't make it through the pandemic. He closed about six months ago. Jimmy was crazy because the dude was butchering whole cows. He would get freaking whole cows in and he would butcher them and grind all the meat and use it for Cincinnati chili one ways and two ways and three ways. And then he would make burgers with his freaking in-house butchered cows. And they were the best damn burgers I think I've ever had. So OTR Chili, man, ordering family meal from them like once a week for our team. I was eating burgers from them like once or twice a week. I was eating tons of OTR Chili burgers and then they went out of business. And there's a hole in my heart ever since. What's a question you want to leave behind for the next guest? If you could be on any beach in the world with any musician, dead or alive, what beach, what musician, and what are you drinking? The next question comes from one of our listeners. Uh, They wrote in, over the course of the next 10 years, is it possible for the Newport Covington food scene to rival Cincinnati's? 100%. I think there's actually a possibility for it to exceed Cincinnati quite easily. And the reason for that all goes back to rent. Young entrepreneurs are attracted by being in a great neighborhood that like seems like it's going to be hot, but also they're attracted by places that they think they can make money and survive. And because Newport and Covington and Bellevue are still under the radar, real estate prices are still under the radar. So if I can get more of my homies and buddies to open ridiculously great spots out here, I think there's a lot more opportunity financially out here right now still because rents are lower because 3CDC doesn't operate these properties in the same way. Totally a possibility. This last set of questions we asked to everybody who comes on the podcast. So compare and contrast across all the episodes. Who was the biggest influence on your cooking career thus far? When you look back on it. Number one, Alice Waters, Chez Panisse, started farm to table cooking, started the idea of a farm to table restaurant, is a complete trailblazer in culinary education. She has like the edible schoolyard. She teaches kids how to farm. It's, it's insane. Number two was my main Indian cooking teacher when I was at the yoga center in Oakland. Her name was Asha. To this day, probably the best cook I've ever met in my life. She wouldn't taste the food because she didn't want to corrupt its beauty and its its essence by being selfish. She could smell if it had enough salt in it. I'm not kidding. It was freaking crazy. Uh, so in terms of like just sheer talent, uh, man, she was amazing. She was an unbelievable cook. What's one kitchen item that's not a knife that you can't live without? 
cast iron pan. Restaurant you recommend that isn't your own. So person gets stuck at the airport, stuck overnight. You guys are closed. They reach out. Hey, where should we go eat? You point them in this direction. My favorite restaurant in town is Mizunte Taqueria. I just actually told two people together this week. My friend Josh runs it. I think it's the best Mexican food in town. He has like a little tortilla station where they make these ridiculous blue corn tortillas fresh the whole damn time you're there. It's my favorite Mexican food in town. <laughs> bucket list travel destination, bucket list restaurants, a place you have not visited yet, but you still want to travel to, and also a restaurant you have not eaten at, but you still want to go to one day. Bucket travel list is my wife and I are going to go to Paris and then rent a car and drive over to the Loire Valley. Bucket list restaurant. I was just looking at them last night. It's called Septime in Paris, the 11th arrondissement. They have like four sister restaurants, which really reminded me of our approach. They have Septime. They have Septime Le Cave, like the wine bar. And they have like a, they have a restaurant called Clamato, Clamato which is like, it's like a, a canned clam product that you can buy here, but it's their seafood restaurant. It looks insane. I think they were like number 24 on the world's best restaurant list, but it seems really cool. So that's where I want to go. Craziest thing you've ever seen happen in a restaurant while you're working? When I was at that yoga center, we had these walks that were, I, I'm going to say three and a half feet wide. And we had these burners that were like, they looked like jet engines when you would light them. The flames would be like eight inches high. They would go, it was, it was psychotic. So I was working with this older gentleman and he's going to deep fry something or he's going to do, I'm not sure what he's going to, I think he was making bok choy stir fry. He dumps his oil in the wok. He rages the burner and he forgets about it. He walks away. I'm talking like maybe, maybe we've got like three and he used way too much oil because he was kind of sloppy. So at this point he has three, four cups of oil in this wok burner. It is raging like a jet engine. And he's walking around the dining room and I look over and this walk goes up like the fucking Olympic torch. I'm talking like flame four feet up out of this walk burner. I start screaming at him. He runs over, grabs a container of sliced onions, throws them in the walk burner to put the fire out. And the thing fireballs up into the Ansel system. Fireballs 10 feet up. That's my first answer. Food or drink guilty pleasure. Is there anything, fast food, candy, whatever that you know is unhealthy for you, but uh, you just can't help yourself? No, you know, got pretty good self-discipline. I don't really like fast food. Uh, I see my, my personal thing. My wife and I drink chai every morning. And this is something that I picked up, you know, from the yoga background, uh, Indian spice tea with milk, ginger, cardamom every single morning. So if there's anything I'm addicted to, it's probably chai. Favorite Instagram account you follow? That one account that you just don't really skip? You know, they always either something entertaining or something knowledgeable that you get from it. No question. Shitty wine memes. What about the guy? who juggles. And while he's juggling, he has a pillow of Nicolas Cage that he throws no look into a basketball hoop. Yeah, I can't remember the name. It's like the broken juggler, I think. And it's all in slow-mo. It is the most hysterical shit I've ever seen in my life. Favorite dish thing you ever cooked, created? Kind of looking back on your career, you can point to this item as kind of like your aha moment. Like You knew you could be a professional chef one day. I have no idea about that, man. I think some of those Indian dinners that I put together, you know, because the style of cooking is called a tali. It's not coursed out. You present everything all at once in the same plate. And so there were some times where we ran like 9, 10, 11 item talis that we made everything. When you get them right, they all balance each other. And they're like this perfect harmony. And so there was a couple of those that I got perfect. And they were like cosmic. I'm an Anthony Bourdain fan, but not everybody is or was. Uh, if you were, is there a moment, episode, scene that always stands out to you about him? If you weren't, is there anybody else who was on TV, whether it's, you know, David Chang, Jacques Pepin, Emeril, somebody that you kind of gravitated towards when you were coming up through your cooking career? Uh, not at all. My main influence was Chef's Table, the Netflix TV show. It's been like, what, like six, seven years now? It's been out for a while. Yeah, he's done a few spinoffs because they just did a pizza one. Chef's Table is to date the only culinary thing that I watch on TV because everything else stresses me out. I'm like, I'm off, dude. I do not want to look at this stuff. It's already making my <laughs> anxiety go up. But Chef's Table is the most incredible blessing to young cooks, to the general populace, but to young cooks because you would never get any proximity like that to these people. The ability to see into their past, to understand their journey. And, and you know, there's one thing, if you look at every single person in Chef's Table, they always had a narrative where they came up against a dark night of the soul. There's always a moment where they said, I believe in myself. I want to do something new. I want to do something crazy. And there was always the moment where they almost failed or they did fail or they had an empty dining room for six months. Or there's always this struggle if you look at everyone's journey and it gives you faith that you can make it through your own journey. And so I think Chef's Table is like 
it is unbelievable asset to culture. I'm very grateful. Where can people find you? Social media, website, reservations, plug everything. Very simple. The restaurant's website is bakerstablenewport.com. The bakery and pizzeria's website is bakerstablebakery.com. So Baker's Table Newport, Baker's Table Bakery. From our websites, you can find everything. There's links to reserve a table, links to our story, links to uh, online ordering, DoorDash ordering uh, for pizza. Uh, that's where you want to be. The restaurant's open Tuesday through Sunday? That would be nice. I'd like to be open more days of the week. Right now, we're just open Thursday to Sunday for dinner. And then the bakery's open Wednesday through Saturday, all day, 8 to 9. And then Sunday, 8 to 2. Like I said, we've been to the baker's table previously. I think we got a bunch of pasta that you guys had on the menu. Also had the the donuts, um, too, at the time for dessert. But uh, everything was amazing. Cool vibe. There was like a jazz band for, you know, probably maybe the first 30 minutes we were that there before they were finished with their night and everything. So definitely looking forward to coming back and definitely looking forward to trying out the bakery and ordering an obscene amount of things from the bakery so we can try them over the course of the week when we stay there in February. So, but yeah, it's, it's an awesome spot. Obviously, people probably know about it from the press from a couple of years ago, but definitely top recommendations for, you know, when someone's in Cincinnati to just jump across the river. It's like five minutes across the river. It's not even hard to get to or anything. There's a parking lot right behind it. So, yeah, this was awesome. You know, looking forward to being back down there and stopping and trying everything. Thanks for doing your homework. Thanks for asking good questions. A big thanks again to Dave for coming on the podcast, taking some time out of his evening to jump on. I know he was pretty busy with the holidays and doing some stuff at the bakery in the mornings and the restaurant at night. Very appreciative of him giving us a bunch of his time to come on and chat about his career and the restaurants and where they've been, where they've headed, all the stuff that they kind of got in the works, different collaborations, pizza nights and all that stuff too as well. So again, you can follow him on Instagram at Dave underscore Willicks. That's W-I-L-L-O-C-K-S. Also follow the restaurant at Baker's Table Newport, and then also the bakery at Baker's Table Bakery. Check out the websites, menu details, reservations, call ahead ordering for pizza or baked goods, stuff like that. All that stuff's available so you guys can find that. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at SpoonMob website. Check that out, SpoonMob.com. You can email us, contact portal on the website or SpoonMob at Yahoo.com. And make sure you follow, subscribe to the podcast, whatever platform that you're using, whatever app or anything like that. So all the new episodes come directly to you as soon as they're released. That is it for this week. We will be back next week with a new episode. So if you're new here, welcome. If you've been here for a while or the entire time since our very first episode, we, as always, appreciate you continuing to listen and continue to support the podcast and download new episodes and everything. So uh, we're glad you're here. Hopefully you're still getting value from everything that we're doing. We got a lot of cool stuff on the way. And I believe uh, next week will be our second ever international episode. And by international, I'm not talking like, Canada. Like we've had people from Canada on. I'm not talking Mexico. I'm talking different continent international. And for this episode, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but we're talking time zones so different. You got to do some math to make sure that you have the recording time right style international. So super excited for everybody to hear that episode. It's just a really different perspective on the industry and different markets that we just haven't really explored. You know, the first international episode we did was with Marcin Kroll of Maison in Paris when we did that in person in San Francisco. So that was an awesome episode. This one's just as awesome. So I'm super excited for everybody to hear that too as well. And uh, as always, we got more cool stuff in the works on the way as well that I think everybody's going to really enjoy here in kind of year three of the podcast. So thank you again. Continue to help spread the word and we will talk to you guys next Thursday.